this week on Christian World News. The classic movie Ben-Hur is widely considered to be one of the greatest of all time. And now it's been updated for a new generation. Meet the cast and crew behind this $100 million blockbuster. And an aerial offensive reaching people in North Korea. The unique method being used to spread the gospel there. Plus, one of the oldest Christian communities in the world is under fire like never before. See how Egypt's cops respond to the rise in persecution. <목소리도> 여러분 안녕하십니까? 크리스천 월드 뉴스입니다. 1959년에 개봉한 고전 영화 배너의 리메이크 작이 개봉했습니다. 현대 기술과 각색을 더해 새로운 옷을 입은 건데요. 영화 써노보갓을 제작했던 부부가 나서 개봉 전부터 화제를 불러일으켰습니다. 그 유명한 전차 경주 장면은 어떻게 다시 태어났을까요? 오늘 첫 소식으로 함께 만나보시죠. Ben Hur is one of the greatest stories ever told, and producers Mark Burnett and Roma Downey are delivering new twists and turns in this $100 million film, based on the more than 130-year-old classic novel written by General Lew Wallace. Crucified. No! You guys don't do anything small, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this redefines epic, doesn't it? I think that's where probably one of the most interesting things about Ben-Hur is that you have this fictional story set at this time in Jerusalem, and it gives a real historic and political context to the world into which Jesus was born. Very complicated time, um, a time of great un civil unrest and injustice and uh, heartache and hurt for an enormous amount of people. And, um, and we're following the journey of these two brothers, Judah and Masala, and that we literally just kind of bump into Jesus in the marketplace. The story pits brother against brother. Jack Houston plays Judah Ben-Hur. You stayed away. You should have killed me. You initially weren't going to try out for the role of Judah. You wanted to be Masala, correct? Yeah, I thought, <laughs> I, thought I had a better shot at getting Masala <laughs> initially. No, no, I, I, I loved, I think Masala is one of the great characters, um, but it was a, a nice sort of segue into Judah because I think it gave me a very deep understanding of my brother and a deep love for my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The brothers, Judah and Masala, battle in a fierce chariot race, where losing could very well mean dying. How much horse training did you have before coming to Ben? -Hur? A vast amount. I mean, I was taught to ride a horse on Prince of Persia many, many, many years ago uh, by the same people who taught us now to ride these chariots. Um, but the training on this, we arrived, I think, six weeks before the actual production. Mm -hmm. And every day you're learning. And we shot the chariots for three months of the six months. Toby Kebble and Jack Houston did not use stunt doubles for these scenes, even as their horses reached racing speeds of more than 40 miles an hour. The speed at which you're going or, or, during the, the circus, intimidating? <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I chipped the tooth, a, a stone hit me in the tooth. I got a wad, it can only be described as a wad of mouth froth covered my whole vision so i as well as the blind driver was cut and then of course the dust is being kicked up it was actually wonderful i know that sounds repulsive but um, <laughs> it was actually a great experience director timor bekmambatov guided the horse racing experience with cameras at every angle he watched hours of NASCAR, Formula One, and motorcycle races to prepare. In shooting this, I understand you got a lot of inspiration from YouTube and Instagram. Less Instagram, but more YouTube videos. And How so? Over, be, be, because uh, uh, it was really important to make this movie looks 
this world looks real and relatable and uh, and and today's world we are watching youtube videos and we are we it's what we know about the world how we know about the world because we're watching youtube videos the chariot race is what most remember from the critically acclaimed 1959 version of the film that starred charlton heston Mark, I've heard you say that this is one, Ben-Hur, the story, is one of your favorites. Intimidated taking on it, it as a film? I mean, 11 Academy Awards and any intimidation or concern? Absolutely, into completely <laughs> intimidated. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, but also feeling that it was a calling um, when Gary Barber, the chairman of MGM, came to us having seen the Bible and Son of God and AD, and realize uh, what we'd brought to those projects. He felt that we'd be a good addition to his team mm -hmm. on Ben-Hur. Uh, we uh, talked it through, we prayed on it, and decided that we should take the challenge because the opportunity may never come along again. It looks so good. Retelling this story is an opportunity many cast members hoped would come their way. This is a biblical period piece. How would you say this story is relevant to 2016 when audiences are gonna see this? This story is so relevant to today. I mean, there's been turmoil throughout history, but right now you're seeing so much um, negativity and you're seeing so much hate spewed out in response to hate. Martin Luther King said it best, Dark darkness doesn't drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate doesn't drive out hate, only love can do that. And this film, is about love conquering hate. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, Los Angeles. 아주 독특한 방식으로 복음을 전하는 스웨덴의 한 교회가 있습니다. 이슬람 극단주의 무장 단체 IS가 점령한 지역에 아주 작은 아랍어 성경을 떨어뜨린다고 하네요. The Word of Life Church says it plans to use drones to drop thousands of the Bibles. They're the size of pill boxes. The church says it's important to remember that the love of the Christian gospel can reach anyone, even those cut off from the outside world. 한편 한국에서도 북한 땅에 복음을 전하고자 노력하는 이들이 참 많은데요. 종교와 자유가 탄압을 당하고 있는 그곳에 예수 그리스도의 사랑을 전하고자 하는 이들의 이야기 함께 만나보시죠. Just before sunset. A van load of Christians from Seoul heads north. We cannot show you their faces or reveal their names. What we're doing could get us into trouble. Where are we going today? Ah. We're going here, some four miles from the North Korean border and close to the demilitarized zone. The demilitarized zone, or DMZ, is one of the most heavily fortified and potentially dangerous places on Earth. We'll just wait up here at the top of the stairs, sir. One million armed North Korean troops stand ready on their side of the DMZ. The South has just as many. And as we get ready to head to this particular location, uh, one factor that uh, could ruin this whole thing is the weather. One slight change in the wind direction could mess up the mission. Peter has dubbed this Operation Dandelion. We started this project back in 1991, and just as a dandelion needs the wind to spread its seed, we need the wind to spread the message. That message is the Word of God, printed in the Korean language on thousands of bright orange balloons. It's almost impossible to get Bibles into North Korea, so using balloons is one of the most effective ways to share the gospel. A tank in the back of the van pumps helium into the balloons. The team works quickly, all the time keeping tabs on the wind direction. Prayers are whispered over each balloon. And then the release. A few minutes later, the balloons begin their slow drift across North Korean airspace. By sending these balloons, we let our North Korean brothers and sisters know that we are praying for them, and the scriptures on the balloons are meant to encourage them. The earnest prayers begin here at this undisclosed location in Seoul. Every week since 1991, 78-year-old Omon Duk, along with a handful of other believers, 
has been preparing each balloon for the flight into North Korea. I was born in North Korea. This is my way of helping to get the gospel back to my countrymen. And the process is almost done. They're just putting the final touches to today's balloon operation. In essence, this is how it works. They, they have a hole in here that they fill helium in, put a tape around it, and then off it goes into the skies of North Korea. The helium will leak out of the balloon and eventually fall to the ground. And when someone picks it up, they'll be able to read all 16 chapters of the Book of Mark. Peter used boats in the past with other groups to launch balloon offensives from the sea. These balloons are larger and contain a small radio, a Bible, and other Christian literature. In addition to the balloon operation, Peter's group organizes a weekly radio broadcast that's recorded in Seoul, then transmitted over medium and shortwave frequencies into North Korea. The radio broadcast is like a regular church service with worship and preaching of the word. The North Korean government routinely tries to jam our signal but we have other methods of getting the message across. And this is what motivates the team. CBN News obtained exclusive audio recordings and photographs of secret underground church meetings inside North Korea. And when a North Korean accepts Jesus Christ, he or she will face persecution, imprisonment, and possibly death because of their faith. Peter gave CBN News footage that apparently aired on a Japanese television channel, allegedly showing the execution of North Korean Christians. <laughs> Trying to get precise figures on the number of Christians today in North Korea is extremely difficult. Based on data gathered from North Korean defectors and international human rights groups, we estimate there are approximately 30,000 Christians being held in political prison camps and about 10,000 underground believers who are in hiding throughout the country. Back along a stretch of the North-South Korean border, it's a little past midnight. Using the cover of darkness, Peter's team continued to deploy hundreds of balloons at multiple locations. Today, the wind conditions have been good. Often the winds will change suddenly and we have to wait. Sometimes we come back the next day. We are persistent. People's lives are on the line. We will continue to do this and continue to pray until North Korea is free and the Christians can worship Jesus Christ without fear. 올 여름 이집트에서는 기독교인들을 향한 공격이 이어지면서 안타까움을 더했습니다. 목회자가 칼에 찔리는 사건부터 교회와 기독교인들이 사는 집이 불타는 등 여러 가지 사건들이 계속 이어진 건데요. 하지만 이러한 가운데서도 교회의 연합은 더욱더 견고해지고 있다고 합니다. 이집트 카이로에서 전합니다. They are one of the oldest Christian communities in the Middle East. 5% of the Middle East now is Christian, and 4 of those 5% are in Egypt. And they're under fire, facing greater persecution this summer than in recent years. Stop burning our church in Egypt! Stop burning our church in Egypt! Only God can protect us. The government cannot. Nobody can. Egyptian Christians know their government can only do so much to keep them safe inside their churches. But many say they'd like to see the government do more to better protect their constitutional right to religious freedom. One step in that direction is a law under consideration in the Egyptian parliament. It would shorten the maximum time churches have to wait to improve existing buildings or build new ones to only four months. In the past, many waited years and others never received permission. Some Christians fear Islamists will pressure legislators to leave the law unchanged. Currently, only about 2,600 churches exist here for a Christian population of at least 10 million. And just the thought of a new church building going up in a village angers many Muslims. In July, this mob attacked Christians and burned their homes after false rumors spread about the construction of an unauthorized church near the town of Beni Swaif. Similar violence happened earlier this summer in Al Baida village. 
Officials arrested six Christians for building a church without a permit. They also arrested six Muslim arson suspects, but later set them free. Often following these attacks, Christians say they must attend humiliating reconciliation sessions with Muslim leaders. The sessions take the place of criminal law proceedings. That's what government leaders wanted to see happen in the case of Soad Thabit, a 70-year-old Christian woman who was recently beaten and paraded naked in the streets of her neighborhood. A mob took the action after accusing her Christian son of having a relationship with a Muslim woman. Mrs. Thabit refused any reconciliation meeting because the sessions often favor Muslim perpetrators over Christian victims. Completely, completely impunity. Uh, uh, reconciliation sessions. There is no justice. We're seeking for justice. We're seeking for law, equality. There is nothing in Egypt. That's why Coptic Orthodox Pope Tuadros II is sounding the alarm, warning that Egyptian Christians face increasing attacks. Archbishop Abna Angelos says this rising violence is nothing new. Egyptian Christians are a resilient bunch. We've been there for 2,000 years. We've outlived Diocletian. We've outlived uh, the Islamic persecution that came in the 7th century. Um, we've outlived a lot, and we're still there. Um, and I think it's because God wants us to stay there. Not only to survive, says Pastor Sammy, but to bless the country. God is our savior, our protector. And um, uh, our goal is not just to be protected. Our goal is to save the country. We are here to save Egypt, not to be saved from Egypt. No, no, no. And since the ouster of President Mubarak, Egyptian evangelical, Orthodox, and Catholic Christians have joined together in prayer. So what happened helped us and forced the true believers to come together. It started by 11-11-11 event that in the cave church where 40,000 people gathered there. The fact that our practices are different doesn't mean our faith is different. Um, the core principles, the core values of our Christianity. We are Trinitarian, that we believe in salvation, we believe in the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've all got, we've got all of that in common. Pastor Sammy believes this spirit of Christian unity will change the nation. Violence and anger and uh, hostility can destroy the nation but love can save the nation. We are seeing tens and hundreds of thousands coming to Christ. And they too are likely to face persecution in this Muslim-dominated nation. I think to be crucified with Christ is to bear the pain knowing that there is a resurrection still to come. So we, we bear it valiantly, faithfully, confidently, knowing that this is not the end of the road. Gary Lane, CBN News, Cairo, Egypt. 최근 이스라엘로 돌아오는 유대인들이 갈수록 늘고 있다고 합니다. 성경의 예언이 이루어지고 있는 건데요. 유대인들이 이스라엘로 돌아올 수 있도록 돕는 한 단체가 있다고 합니다. 함께 만나보시죠. Earlier this year, immigrants from North America landed at Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion International Airport to make Israel their home. Seeing Jewish people return to Israel is literally watching Bible prophecy unfold. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel all speak of the Jewish return to the land. It says several times in Isaiah, I will lift up a banner to the nations, to the Gentiles. They shall bring your sons and your daughters back. Deborah Minotti heads Operation Exodus, an organization that helps Jews return to their biblical homeland. She says since 2014, there's been a 79% increase of inquiries about assistance to return to Israel. If I can just give glory to God because this is his work. In 1948, Israel had 800,000 Jewish people in the land when they became a nation in one day, like Isaiah said. Now there's over 6 million. So that is incredible, over 67 years. And so they're going back. I, the plane loads yearly. Operation Exodus partners with the Jewish Agency for Israel and other groups to help Jews move to Israel. The organization also provides humanitarian aid to Holocaust survivors and others in the former Soviet Union. A big part in helping those seeking to return is the power of prayer. We pray for their safety. We also pray that they would get jobs quickly. 
And those things that are holding them back here, the frustrations, you know, there's family issues that are going on, children who are sick. Minotti says there are many reasons Jews are returning to their homeland. Many of them are saying, Hashem is calling us back to the land. Others are saying, I want my children to be raised in a Jewish homeland. Other ones are saying, I want to defend Israel. I want to be there. I'm a Zionist. They say this is 1939, some of them. They say that we see the handwriting on that wall. Motivated by love for Israel and for the Jewish people, Operation Exodus offers Minati and others the opportunity to work with God to bring his prophecies to pass. You wake up and you think, what an awesome responsibility and what an awesome joy it is at the same time. It is deep joy. And there's a cost to standing with Israel. So um, it is, it's intense, but I love it. I love it. And our workers love it. Our volunteers love it. It's only, it's only going to grow. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. 오늘 준비한 소식은 여기까지입니다. 저는 다음 주에 다시 찾아오겠습니다. 시청해주신 여러분 고맙습니다.